right, now we're getting to uh, Revelation chapter 20. Now we're coming to the end, and uh, we've moved on to the next feast in the series, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for your abundant goodness and grace. We thank you for this time of studying your word, Lord. I pray, Father God, that you'll give us wisdom and understanding, God. Open our hearts, Father God. Open our ears unto your word, Lord. Father God, that we may understand, Father God, the concepts of your coming kingdom and what's going to come, Lord, in the future. We just give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so as I've entitled this one, uh, Revelation chapter 20, uh, 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ or King Jesus, the Feast of Tabernacles. And for those of you who've been watching uh, Revelation, we've, I've been using the Feast of the Lord like a template. So uh, well, I'll explain the Feast of Tabernacles and how this relates to that. So we'll continue in the narrative here in chapter 20. So it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss, holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss, shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he could not deceive the nations until the thousand years were complete. After that, he must be released for a brief time period. So here, this is kind of like in conjunction with what we read last week about the destruction, if you will, of, you know, of the Antichrist and the false prophet as they're destroyed after the, you know, the battle of Armageddon and Jesus Christ returns. So after this also, Satan is also, if you will, jailed at this time and cast into the abyss. And as you recall, we've kind of studied how and saw how some of the, you know, there were a certain group of angels uh, that looked like locusts who had come out of the abyss, and we kind of related those to those uh, also in Genesis chapter 6, and how in the book of Enoch it talks about how they were sealed in this abyss for, I believe it was 70 generations and soon to be released, but this is probably that same location that Satan is actually getting confined. So this isn't hell. Uh, hell's a, another location. We'll look at that next week. We'll look at hell, the, you know, the abyss and the lake of fire. But right now, just understand that Jesus, or not Jesus, Satan is removed from the earth, and now Jesus begins this thousand-year reign over the earth. So as we're looking at the feasts of the Lord, as we start clockwise on this, uh, and start with the spring feast, the first one we have there is Passover, which is the first one, then unleavened bread, then uh, first fruits, and they're all in the spring. And then the next one comes is, uh, as we go cl uh, clockwise again, Pentecost, which is the fourth one. And as we kind of go like uh, clockwise again, we'll see the Feast of Trumpets, which is this uh, fifth one, the Day of Atonement, the sixth. And finally, the Feast of Tabernacles is the seventh and the final feast, which completes, if you will, the cycle. Then it starts all over again. But as we saw... Uh, trumpets in the Day of Atonement had more of this idea of judgment and, and uh, repentance and, you know, fear. And now, after all this time of uh, trembling and trials on the earth, now comes the joy as Jesus Christ returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth. So in Leviticus chapter 23, uh, verse 29, or 39, it says, On the 15th day, of the seventh month, and here we see again these sevens. Remember, we see all the revelation in, in Revel, uh, throughout Revelation that number seven. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. And here's this, you know, again seven days. So what's kind of interesting as we as we were studying, we kind of looked at the feasts of the Lord. It's almost like a marriage. We saw the spring feast, how Jesus Christ bought us, if you will, as a bride. And paid for us, and we saw kind of Pentecost, kind of like the giving of the, the, the wedding ring, or, or engagement ring, rather, you know, with the sealing of the Holy Spirit. But then finally, he goes to prepare a place for his bride, and then he returns. And now, at his return, there's this, what, seven-day wedding feast. And if you recall, in, when you read in John, the wedding at Cana, the seven-day wedding feast that took place there. So this is kind of in relation to that. But here, it's a time at the end of the harvest that they were to rejoice and celebrate what they had gathered from the produce of the land. So likewise, as we kind of look at this symbolically, we see this kind of like this harvest, if you will, and so we've been using these harvest metaphors as well. We see also the harvest of the nations. We kind of saw 
how the 144,000 were the first fruits of Jesus Christ, now there's still, you know, the people that remain on the earth, and now comes this final harvest, if you will, and then now all the nations, if you are gathered on the earth, and those who remain after this battle of Armageddon, actually become part of God's kingdom, and actually begin to really serve Jesus Christ and establish his kingdom here on earth. It says, on the first day, back to Leviticus again, uh, describing the Feast of Tabernacles, you are to gather the fruit of majestic trees, the branches of palm trees, and the boughs of leafy trees, and the willow of the brook, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So here God commands us to rejoice. So before this time, it's like I said, there's this, you know, wars and sadness and grief and trials. So now it's kind of like the birth of the baby has come. You know, Jesus used that explanation of the end of the age like birth pangs or... Um, and here now, finally, the, the baby has been born, so now it's time to rejoice. So those birth pangs are over. Now it's a time for rejoicing. But also notice this idea they're gathering, you know, God calls them to gather in these uh, various uh, species of, of trees. And what, we're going to look at that later on. But right now, just understand that this is one of the things they do. Today, the modern Jewish people, they celebrate that using, if you will, these, uh, if you look in this picture here, they'll take that. This is a a palm branch, it's supposed to be a date palm, and then here they have a myrtle, and then they have a willow, and then they take uh, an, a citron, or they call it an esrog, and they'll gather that, and they'll use that, and they'll celebrate that. As you see, there's a bunch of Jewish men here carrying those uh, various plants, if you will. Then it says, and, and all that survived from the nations will come, all that survived from the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And should any of the families of the earth not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, the rain will not fall on them. So what's kind of interesting, so during this time period, it's my opinion that when Jesus comes, the biggest holiday, you know, like for Christians, it tends to be Easter and Christmas as well. But, you know, if you go from the biblical source, Easter or Passover tends to be the be the most celebrated. But when Jesus returns, I believe this is going to be, you know, supersede that, and uh, people are going to celebrate. As a matter of fact, all those who survive are commanded, or if you will, the, probably the leaders, to go to Jerusalem to worship and honor the king during this time of uh, Sukkot or Feast of Tabernacles. There in the back is a picture to, of, you know, this year actually, 2019, where uh, they call it the Parade of Nations. And um, you'll notice there's flags representing, all, you know, just different people, nations throughout the world. You know, it's Togo, China, Romania, looks like Germany or Russia. And you see all these. So what people do, you know, modern day Christians who have come to see this as kind of like prophetic fulfillment, they'll actually come during the Feast of Tabernacles and they have this what they call the Parade of Nations. And for the Jewish people, they see this as a sign of their end times because now the nations are coming <laughs> during this time of Feast of Tabernacles. So, so it kind of astounds the Jewish people that, wow, why would all these Christian people come marching into Jerusalem just like it says in the Bible? And they see that it's kind of a prophetic fulfillment, if you will. But there, when Jesus comes back and establishes his kingdom, it's going to probably be celebrated in a greater, um, in a greater, if you will, sphere of atmosphere because it's going to be, the whole world's going to honor this day. What's kind of interesting is during the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, in Numbers, it talks about the sacrifices they're to give, but the unique one is they're to sacrifice 40 bulls. And if you'll notice, they sac like I said, this is a seven-day celebration. So on the first day, they'll start with 13, and it goes all the way down. And finally, on the seventh day, they have seven bulls. So if you add up all the, the total of that number, you get 70 bulls. So the question is, why are they sacrificing 70 bulls? And what the rabbi says is that they're actually doing a sin offering for all the nations of the world. And, uh, and the question is, how do you get, you know, 70, or why, how do they get that understanding? So what we have to understand is that 70 in the scripture, according to rabbinic tradition, is that 70 represents the nations. And actually, where they get this from is in Genesis chapter 10. So this past week, all over the world, Jewish people are reading the book of uh, Genesis, and specifically the part about the flood, and it's there in Genesis 10 
where they're given the table of nations, and it says, and these are the generations of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Yafet. Then it gives all these names, and this is what I'm, you know, every time I, you know, people say, oh, I don't read my Bible because there's so many names in there, right? <laughs> so this is one of those sections where there's just a list of all these names. But if you were to count up all the names, it would come to the total of 70. So in other words, after the flood, and God, you know, God destroys pretty much the population of the earth. Now God wants to what? Refill the earth with people and send them throughout the, the world. But all the descendants of Noah, their sons actually, equals 70. So they say that, that 70 represents the nations of the world. You'll notice in Genesis 46, 70 souls, not necessarily came out to Egypt, but 70 souls went to Egypt. It's probably the, so in other words, it's this idea that Jacob had 70 descendants in his family, and they're the ones that actually went into Egypt. And when they came out of Egypt, Israel became a nation. So we see this idea of nationhood there again. And likewise, as we saw here, the 70 bulls and the Feast of Tabernacles, the idea that they're sacrificing these bulls for the nations, for their sins, and cleansing their sins, if you will. Then we also see this number 70, the elders uh, that assist Moses in Numbers chapter 11. And today they're called the Sanhedrin. And these are 70 people that were, you know, if you read in context, that, you know, Moses was carrying a heavy load, so God calls him, hey, get men who can assist you, if you will. And these eventually became what, you know, the modern day, when you read in the Bible, this, the Sanhedrin. And um, what's kind of unique about this is the rabbis actually say that each and every member has to at least speak another language because they represent the nations of the world. So that's kind of interesting. So, um, in my opinion, is it, you know, I'm just kind of, as I'm thinking about the end times and the future, is it possible that Jesus will set up a council and have one representative from every nation of the earth, kind of like the Sanhedrin there in Jerusalem? You know, it's, it's possible. And if you recall in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out, you know, uh, the 12. Then it says he also sent out the 70 disciples that were sent out to, you know, to minister throughout the land. But if you look at the number 12, 12 represents what? The 12 tribes of Israel. So God, so Jesus is concerned what? About the nation of Israel. But on top of that, he sends out the 70 because he wants to also minister to who? The nations. You see what I mean? So when you begin to understand this number and why God, you know, Jesus uses these numbers, you begin to understand symbolically what's kind of going on in the scripture. So here it says, as we continue in uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 23, you are to live in booths for seven days. All the native born of Israel must live in booths. Basically, the booths could be another tabernacles, or today they call them sukkahs. So if you look in the back, there's a picture in the street of Jerusalem. They build these little shacks, and they'll actually live in those for a seven-day period. Some people will only eat their meals in there. Some people, like I said, go full board and they'll live in there for the full seven days outside their house. So that your descendants will know that I made the Israelites live in booths or tents when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Jehovah, your God. So here they're commanded to go outside and live in this uh, tent facility, if you will, for a seven-day period. But they're also, like I said, they're there to rejoice and celebrate you know, here's uh, me and my family, we kind of, as I began to understand, you know, like I said, some of these uh, ideas of the Jewish holidays, we started incorporating it in our, just, you know, as part of our yearly ritual, if you will. <coughs> so I'll make this little uh, tarp shack, you know, <laughs> and then we'll just have a meal in there, but then we'll discuss, you know, this holiday, and we'll discuss Revelation, we'll discuss the things, and we'll just have a good time, and you see them in the back, I have my, my uh, four species and my little citron, and... <laughs> Um, but also in modern day uh, uh, Jewish people, when they actually get married, they actually build what they call a chuppah, and it's supposed to represent the same idea of that sukkah. So in other words, it's the bridal chamber. So if you recall, like I said, it's this idea of a wedding. So if, like I said, as we kind of looked at the Feast of the Lord, first the bride is bought and paid for, then there's actually a, a covenant that's made and established like the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Then finally, the, 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 the man goes off to prepare the place for the bride. Then finally, he comes back, right? And then after that, now they have this seven-day uh, 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 wedding feast 
wherein there they consummate the marriage. So in ancient times, they would actually have a little tent, right, in the back. And there the couple would actually consummate the marriage, and that would make the marriage final. So this is kind of that same idea. So likewise, during this time period, and there's this time of rejoicing. And, you know, like, how many of you guys have gone to a wedding, and, you know, it's festive, everybody's smiling, everybody's looking at each other. You know, there's this anticipation, you know, well, they like each other. You know, there's all this, you know, what's the future going to be like? You know what I mean? So it's kind of the same idea of this, you know, this wedding supper, if you will. As we read last time in uh, Revelation chapter 19, then he said, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the, of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. So when we understand, so as we saw the Yom Kippur, this was actually the bride preparing, right, for the marriage. So now when Sukkot comes around, when Jesus returns, so now that's that time period when Jesus will actually, you know, they'll have that wedding feast, if you will. What's kind of interesting in John chapter 7, there's actually uh, a scripture in John that talks about the Feast of Tabernacles. Although it doesn't mention tabernacles, John assumes you understand that's what he's talking about. <laughs> so here in John chapter 7, 37, 39, it says, In the last day of the great feast, and this great feast is he's talking about, is the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Then he spoke this about the Spirit, which they who believed on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So here, what you have to understand is, uh, you kind of have to understand the, what's going on on this you know, final day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And what they had is they had this idea called the water drawing ceremony. So, but before this time, you know, for, for the previous six days, um, many of the people from Israel, they'd come in with these, remember, they were supposed to bring in willows and palm branches, but specifically at this time period, they took actually willow branches, and this is only during the second temple period, although it's not written in the Bible, you don't read about it, but this is a tradition that they, that they did. So they take these real long willows, and what they would do, they'd march around the altar, uh, seven times, kind of like the Jericho march. But then they'd take these, you know, willows and they'd shake them, you know. And you have to understand, if, if, imagine this mass of humanity carrying these willow branches. And it's the idea they're making, as they're shaking it back and forth, it's the idea of wind. And what's kind of interesting in the Bible, ruach is also the same word for wind. It could mean breath. It could also mean spirit. So here they're shaking this, you know, these palm branches, or not, the willow branches, and trying to create this wind, if you will. Then finally, in the final day, what they would do is the high priest would go to the Pool of Siloam, and there he would gather a pitcher of water, and there'd be this big procession of people going back to the temple. And people would be rejoicing, shouting, you know, celebrating. And uh, one of the things they would actually say is, Hoshana Rabbah, which means the great salvation, is really what that means. And uh, they'd go back to the temple, then they'd sing this song, about the well of salvation. So as they're singing this song about the well of salvation, here's Jesus saying, hey, I'm the well of salvation, right? <laughs> he who believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So when you begin to understand, you have to understand the context of what's going on. He's talking about there that he's actually the living well, right? So as they're doing, so what they would do is he'd go back to the altar. Then he would have actually have on one side, he'd have uh, a pitcher of water. The other side, he'd have a pitcher of wine, and he'd pour it on the altar, and there was kind of like this little uh, funnel system. But as he poured it out, all the people would start shouting, rejoicing. And also, this was also a time that they would actually pray for rain. As you recall, in Zechariah, it says if people did not go and honor the king, there would be no rain. So this is a time they would actually pray for rain. So here, Jesus is kind of saying, hey, Hey, when you begin to understand what you guys are doing, this I'm fulfilling, I'm the fulfillment of this idea. And what's kind of interesting, what I kind of see this as, is when you begin to understand the feasts of the Lord, they're rehearsals, remember, like we said, of a future event. So as they're shaking these willows, it's the idea of the Holy Spirit, and as this water is poured out, it's kind of like the water is going to be poured out where all over the earth. So although they're doing this event, they probably don't understand why they're doing it, but in my opinion, it kind of represents that final time when Jesus comes and there's a new world, a new heavens and a new earth. 
And then all of a sudden now the Holy Spirit is poured out throughout the whole earth. And all the nations come and understand the Lord. What's kind of interesting in Numbers 14.21 it says, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And here we have to read in context what it's talking about. If you recall when the spies went the first time, they went to Jer- you know, they kind of spied out the land and they came out and what did they, they, brought a, they brought a bad report. And so here God wanted to what? Establish his kingdom there in the land of Israel at that time. But because of their, their fear, you know, they convinced all the other people, oh, we can't take the land, we can't take the land. But then God says, and, it, and you know, when I read this, it kind of really occurred to me. You know, at that time, there's no church. People, the whole world have no idea that God even exists, right? Jehovah, people have no idea. I mean, this, these are the only people that know who he is. And it's in his heart to what? To establish his name and his glory throughout the earth. But here they kind of mess it up. But then at the same time, I, I just began to really see that God has always had a heart and a passion to what? To have people know that he exists, to know his goodness, to know the fruit of the spirits, right? That his glory, his love, his joy, his peace, right? So this is his, his desire has always been from that time period to fill the earth with his glory. What's kind of interesting, and you know, the prophets in Habakkuk kind of take the same word for the, for it says in Habakkuk 2.14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And what this is talking about, it's talking about a future time. So in other words, it's talking about the time when Jesus returns. Everybody's going to know the Lord. Everybody's going to know Jesus. Everybody's going to know. So it's going to be a totally different environment than we experience today. As I said, we're kind of, you know, during this time period, the Jewish people read about Noah and the flood. So this kind of really reminded me. Every time I've come to this place, there, there, there's a time when the flood, you know, the flood is over, the waters go down, and then Noah wants to, he's wondering, can I get out of the ark? So when you read the, the narrative, first it says he sends out a, a raven to test to see if, you know, the, the waters have subsided. And it just says that the, the raven kind of just went back and forth, back and forth. And, uh, but never really returned into the ark. So then Noah says, well, I'll use a dove. So he takes a dove, sends it out. But it said the dove couldn't find a place to rest its feet. So this dove comes back to the ark. And then afterwards, seven days later, on this second time, he actually sends this dove out again. It goes out, but this time it brings an olive branch or an olive leaf. So he waits again another seven days. And then finally, on that third try, it says he waited another seven days and sent the dove out again, but it did not return to him this time. So I've always wondered, why is this in the Bible? I mean, for, you know, like I said, I've read it year after year after year after year. I'm always pondered, why is this there? And, and all of a sudden, I don't know whether, whether this is true or not. I just kind of began to think about it. And if you go back... I've come to the opinion that this represents different ages of the earth. So the first age, if you will, second, third, and second and third, if you will. So the first age would be actually from Adam to Noah. We have to understand that was a different world. That was a different time period. And if you recall, so here many times the raven, if you will, represents a negative, you know, connotation. If we read in the Bible, it talks about, and the birds of the air, right? Remember the the parable of the sower? The birds of the air stole the seed, and the birds represent what? The evil one. So many times in Scripture, birds are represented in a a negative connotation. We kind of read about the birds. What did the birds do to all the armies at Armageddon? (laughs) They ate them up. So in other words, they have this, this unclean. So in my opinion, this kind of represents, during the first uh, time, if you will, uh, at the beginning of the world, Satan and his hordes kind of went out and established their environment or their domain throughout this earth. So Jesus or God tries to send out the Holy Spirit during this first section, but it doesn't, it goes out, but it doesn't really, the Holy Spirit doesn't really go out throughout the earth. And only finally after 10 generations, only Noah and his family are the only ones that know about God. And the whole world is destroyed, right? So then if we look at it from that perspective, then maybe then this second time, 
after the flood, there's a new creation, new heaven, new earth. And this is our generation. And I believe what this represents, the Holy Spirit goes out. But then here, it picks up this, uh, this branch, this olive branch. And it, in my opinion, could that represent the cross? So is it kind of like the Holy Spirit falls only on those who have received Jesus Christ, but it doesn't really fall on everybody else, right? So in others, there are people that know about God, so it's kind of like the Holy Spirit goes out, but then what does it do? <laughs> it comes back, right? So then finally, you know, on this third time, the Holy Spirit goes out, but it doesn't return. So in my opinion, this is kind of like this third age, when Jesus comes back, establishes his kingdom on earth, then finally the Holy Spirit goes out throughout the whole world, and then now the whole world is filled with the glory and the knowledge of the Lord. And this is why during this time when Jesus comes back, this, third, this second time rather, it's gonna, everybody's going to know the Lord. Everybody's going to worship God. And it's going to be a totally different environment, as we'll see. Uh, Revelation 24, it says, And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So what we have to understand during this time period, there's going to be, not only are there going to be regular people that are living in human fleshly bodies, but there's going to be us <laughs> in, in glorified bodies. So when we begin to understand, it says, so as we read in Corinthians, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in decay, but raised in immortality. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual. So when we begin to understand, I believe our body is going to be like Jesus. It kind of makes me think about Jesus after the resurrection. You know, here the, all the disciples are discussing, you know, was that really Jesus? Who is this? You know what I mean? They're one, and then all of a sudden he appears in the room, right? So, and then, so in other words, he just kind of like walks through the walls. So are, are we going to have that capability? I really believe we are because we're going to have a different body, a, a different, like I said, it's going to, we're going to be totally changed. And, um, but also we're going to be physical because, you know, here's uh, Thomas. Is that really you? You know, I'm not going to believe until I touch your hand, right? <laughs> so, so when you begin to understand, there's this physicalness at the same time. But what we have to understand, Satan's going to be removed from the earth, right? So it's going to be a totally different environment. There, there, there is going to be no devil to cause temptation. <laughs> so it's kind of like, in my, you know, as I'm kind of just thinking about this, so during this time period, I'm, I'm sure people are going to think we're like angels, right? <laughs> I mean, really, that we're like, so in order to establish, you know, Jesus' kingdom throughout the whole earth, it's going to require us also to what? To go to all different parts of the world, right, and represent him and establish his kingdom on earth. It says, and as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, tell us, they, told, they said, when will the, this happen, and what will be the sign of the coming of the end of the age? And the word I kind of want to look at is really the, the age, because many times, some people, when they read this, they're thinking, when will be the end of the world? That, that, that's not really what that word age. Age actually means, as we look in Strong's Concordance, aeon, a space of time, an age. If we look in the Bible helps there, as we read in the red, an era, a span of time. So in other words, when we look at how God does things, so we look at how, from the time of Adam to the time of Noah was an age. So in other words, during that time period, the world was a totally different environment. And when you look at the age of the people in uh, Noah's lineage, some people lived 900 years, Methuselah, right? Some people lived 600 years. Some people lived 700 years. But then after the flood, something happened to the earth. And I believe it's that 23 and a half degree tilt. Now that we have this, you know, spring, summer, winter, fall, but also it caused human lifespan to go down to basically about 120 max, if you will. David says 70 is a good age to die. So 
So in our age, we only live for a certain span. You know what I mean? We, we, we live, we die. It's kind of, in a way, I kind of see it as a blessing. Because imagine a Hitler living for 600 years, right? <laughs> Otherwise, the world would have been destroyed sooner. So, so we see later on in Revelation, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. But likewise, we see the same thing in Isaiah, although it's a totally different event. So here in Isaiah 65, uh, 17 through 19, it gives us this, a, a description of what this you know, final world will be like. And uh, so it says, For behold, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. So when it's saying that, it's talking about an age. So in other words, when Jesus comes back, remember we saw when God was in the tabernacle, it is done. He didn't, remember, he, what, he didn't say it is done. Recreate, right? So the whole... So this whole world is recreated. It has a whole different atmosphere. It's, everything's new. Satan's removed from the earth. You know what I mean? There's, it's a totally different environment. So now begins this new age, if you will, this new eon. So the former age has ended. Now begins this new age, if you will, a new heaven and a new earth. For the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a joy and its people to be a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sounds of weeping and crying will no longer be heard in her. So here, as we see again, Sukkot, this time of rejoicing, this time of joy and refreshing. As we continue, it says, No longer will the nursing infant live but a few days, or an old man not live out his years, for the youth will die at a hundred years. Can you imagine that? So here's, you know, we see an older couple in the background. Those guys would still be like toddlers. <laughs> so, so you have to understand the, the, the whole environment's going to change. So when Jesus comes back, there's something he's going to do to change this atmosphere of the world. So it says, and he who fails to reach 100 will be considered accursed. So if you don't even make it to an age of 100, they're going to say, man, there's something wrong with that guy. <laughs> what sin did he have? All right. <laughs> And then, how many of you guys have heard the lion shall lie with the lamb? That's kind of a trick question. <laughs> it doesn't say that, but there's, a, there's this connotation that it does. Actually, what it says, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb. <laughs> and the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And the little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. So here we see this now, this lion no longer has this beastly nature. You know? Now he becomes like what? Cattle. You know, he's eating grass with the cows. He's not devouring. He's not a carnivore. You know, he's not vicious. <laughs> but there's going to be this, even the nature of these animals are going to change. The nursling child will play over the lair of a cobra, and a weaned child will put his hand over the den of a poisonous snake. Can you imagine that? Even the nature of snakes will change. It also talks about scorpions doing the same thing. Can you imagine? Hey, where's little Johnny? Oh, he's in the back playing with his cobra. <laughs> where's little Susie? Oh, she's playing with her scorpions. <laughs> right? So like I said, this is going to be it's a totally different world. So what we have to understand that when Jesus comes back, it's, going to be, it's not going to be this, the world that we live in. It's going to be a totally different environment, totally different domain. But also, we're, you know, as Christians, you know, who resurrect from the dead, we're actually going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ to establish that environment. And I just want to finish off with this uh, last scripture. It says, In the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, it will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem. Then he will judge between the nations and arbitrate for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their pruning, hip, pruning spears into and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer take up sword against nation, nor train anymore for war. So now we're going to finally see this era of real world peace, right? 
So it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be a totally different environment. Nations aren't going to have armies anymore. They're going to be, you know, peace between nations. Why? Because Jesus is establishing his kingdom on his earth, but also people are going to know what? They're going to know the word of the Lord. They're going to know how to forgive each other. They're going to know how to love each other. They're going to know, right? Because I'm sure we're going to be teaching them how to do this. <laughs> Initially, I'm sure there's going to be bumps in the road. But as we begin to share the word during this time period, and likewise, this is why it's important for us also, when we begin to apply God's word, live it in our lives, we actually establish that in our households. We can establish the kingdom of God in our own domains where we live, and we can actually establish this environment in our household, although it may not be throughout the whole world, but we can live this type of life even today as a fulfillment later on that this whole world is going to be filled with the glory of God. Amen? So this is the hope. Like I said, I always, you know, every time I teach Revelation, I'm always kind of like relieved <laughs> after teaching, you know, about all the destruction, the hurt, the pain. And I kind of, I, I, I begin to understand how Jeremiah the prophet felt. You know, here he's, you know, he, all he has is just bad words. Babylon's going to destroy you. You're going to be captives. You know what I mean? And, you know, people want to hear good news and blessing and all this stuff. But, you know, I was like, God. I don't like telling him. Well, he goes, well, it's my word. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I just got to obey and do it. And after, but after I'm done telling it and telling the good part, then I feel, whew, got through that. And this is what we're looking forward to. Like I said, so, so what we have to understand, the world after, if we call the end times, is not going to be totally destroyed, but there's still another thousand years to go. But how many of you guys know a good thing doesn't last forever, <laughs> right? So next week, we'll see how this all comes to an end. And uh, we'll study that next week. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you, Father, for the hope, Father God. We thank you, God, for your son to return and establish his kingdom here on earth, Lord. We pray, Father God, that you'll prepare our hearts, prepare our lives, Father God, to establish your kingdom in our households, Father. Father, that we can live with peace, with joy, with righteousness, Lord, with blessing, with abundance, Lord, with your goodness, with kindness, with forgiveness, Lord, with mercy and grace. I pray, Father God, that you just fill this to overflowing in each and every one of us, God. Let us exude this, Father, as we represent you, Jesus Christ, Lord. Let you emanate through us. Let us be your hands, Father God, that walk about and serve others, Father God, and establish your kingdom, Father God, wherever we may go. We just give you all the praise and the glory, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father God, and we thank you for your future coming kingdom, and we thank you, Father God, for the resurrection, Father God, and for this new day that will come. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen.